All right, so we are live. Hello and welcome everyone to the webinar Outdoor Learning Pedagogical Approaches. This webinar is part of the Terra mission, Teaching Sustainability for Action MOOC. My name is Miriam Molina and on behalf of the Live Terra project and Scientix team, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. My colleague, Julia Lotina, is also attending and supporting this session. If you experience technical issues, please leave us a message in the chat box. In this webinar, our speakers will discuss about what outdoor learning is and its benefits for primary and secondary school, how to organize outdoor activities and see some practical examples. Today with us, we have Dr. Yari Silander and Gloria Falomir Orti. Dr. Yari Silander is a water resource management expert from the Finnish Environment Institute. His multidisciplinary education in water resource management economics and meteorology has supported his work of coordinating the development of national monitoring programs and involvement of several government key projects, such as the outdoor education projects. Gloria Falomir D is a social worker, environmental educator, agroecology technician and community facilitator. She is a member of the nonprofit association Interpreta Natura in Spain. Currently, she coordinates the Active Rural School project in Valde Almonacid an open school that, hand in hand with the community, discovers the natural, cultural and material heritage of the municipality. And before I pass the floor to our speakers, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. First, please make sure your sound is turned on. And we would like to remind you that during this webinar, your cameras and microphones are off. Secondly, Thank you for posting your questions in the, in the, in the course in advance. Uh, we got many, many questions, but if you have any additional questions, please post them in the chat and we will collect them and address them in the end. And this webinar is recorded and we will publish it in the course so you can watch it again if you wish. And now finally, without further ado, Yari, the floor is yours. Uh, thank, thank you, Molina. So my name is Jari Zillander and I work for Finnish Environment Institute, uh, which is a national environment agency that actually collects all the environment information about species, water quality, air quality, and uses that to evaluate the uh, uh, environment quality, whether it's uh, the wildlife or birds or water or air. And then we report this to the European Commission with, with our supervising ministries. In Syke, so we collect this data also via uh, national center that produces like flood forecasting and open data services directly to the environment data. The, in this image you will see, uh, ac actually I'm currently in the city of Helsinki and, and we are doing research this is an uh, image from one of our research, what we are currently doing. It's a system that measures the water quality and, and climate gases from the water. And then we combine this uh, uh, information into the satellite data and crowdsource data or, or educational data. So if students are going into the field, we can combine their information into our data also to get a better picture of the environment quality. So in this image, actually, you see the methane sensors and, and, and carbon dioxide sensors and then chlorophyll cell sensors. And this same that data is collected from satellites. And you, if you measure, for example, water, tra water transparency, we can combine that information to make a better chlorophyll e estimates and, and predictions in the particular area we are, are interested in. Here you see me my background that, that, that Molina was already telling. So we have carried out numerous projects and now this the project I'm telling is that it is an outdoor project that we have done within the Finland and it involved about 250 teachers and, and 10 different municipalities. Also we are doing work with the Russians and other countries and with their teachers. And that's why I'm here too. My speak, what I'm talking about, I'm talking about three subjects, the services we are pro providing to the 
schools and universities and other organizations that can be used in the education as well, but also in the research. And the second is that there is a is a, this outdoor project where we combine the national curriculum to to research process and how we can take that and that that process and, and go to the nature and do these outdoor activities with with schools and how they can be designed and what equipment and tools we are providing them with and then i and supply and then i provide a couple of examples of that but it all starts about the planning that before we go, of course, we think about organize, educate, instruct people, and then we go to the nature. And the idea there, of course, is to build this em empathy towards environment and, and do some activities in the nature, whether they are monitoring activities or some restoration activities you might think of in the nature removing plastics or whatever you interests people. Last time what we did, we measured discharge and that was also interesting for students. And then monitoring activities and analysis of results. So the services uh, originally as we are environment agency and, and we have provided these services for experts only. So they have been very difficult to use. And not until like five, five, ten years ago, we have design services also, also that can be used in schools. And earlier they were only used at the for our experts and then universities, and now also schools are able to access our services. And one of those services that is a wiki-based service on, on the website jarvi.fi. And there it's it's in many languages, also in English, and we have also Russian version. And it was created to exchange knowledge, so the student can go to the Järvi Wiki and discuss about certain particular lake and get the get the measurements that we are doing as a government office from that particular lake, but also submit their own observations and discuss about interesting topics around this lake. And this kind of service was developed to be able to work with the, with the schools and, and public in common because it's very simple to use these wiki services. And we have said that this is very popular. We have about 50,000 users weekly during the summertime when it's busy. And the schools can can establish observation si sites into this, this particular lake they are interested. In Finland, of course, it's lakes, lakes because we have already 100,000 lakes. So near every school there is a lake. So that's why it interests schools. But most of all, it interests schools because they can discuss about these topics with, with each other and share their opinions. And they see what species are in that lake, what's the quality of that lake, and what is the environment status so compared to other lakes also they can see from the service. But before the data comes into this kind of wiki service, it needs to be make sure that it's measured properly especially when we are talking about official reporting and, and this European reporting. So we have this kind of environment certified laboratory that makes sure that everything is in order and the results we get are within a certain uncertainty. But in fact, as, as current just, just uncertainty is important in that sense that when we combine the information that is collected by a student, we should be we should be aware of the uncertainty that data involves. So if a student measures that we know that it has a high uncertainty, but anyway, it has a value when we when we do the like forecast for water quality, for example, each observation provides some value. And especially satellites provide good value because they have quite good spatial coverage. Then we have also developed uh, services which are based on image recognition. And then other internet based services, we are collecting data from the crowd and public, whether they are jellyfish or alien species or microplastics. So whatever interests people and, and has interest for, for, for us and, and we can use to improve the quality of, quality of environment, 
environment we are interested in. So the services, open data services, originally started from in 1994 when internet was launched. There became available meteorological data worldwide from all the, near all countries that are part of the World Meteorological Organization. So that was actually the start of the meteorological data. And, and some people thought that no, no, it's not available from Finland, but I can say it was available in Finland also. Even the government funded 2006 uh, Meteorological Office to open that data. It was still available. It was available in Spain and Romania and other countries too, but only meteorological data. So we have actually improved our open data services so that you can get access to the species through user-friendly interfaces like this LAIPIS-FI. That's a service that is, is fairly user-friendly also for schools. You can see different species, whether they are invasive species, you can detect species and subject also your observations to there. Uh, Water-related services we have under VESI, which means water, and, and you can find them from, from there. And there are open data services uh, like you can use it that with the, through the machine learning, through the machine reading interfaces. So directly into your, into Excel, you can get acquired data uh, in the schools. That's a little bit harder to use because then you need to know exactly where to put this data. And it's not commonly used in Finland. So the teachers actually doesn't know how to use it yet. So it's not enough user friendly, this machine interface. So there needs to be some kind of like a website like this Vesipistefis where you can access and, and click this and then you get the data. But it would be easier to use these machine related services. Then we have, of course, different kind of educational material because education is one of the ta seven tasks what we do in Finland. Uh, then we provide some tools to calculate your ecological footprint or water footprint or, or, or whatever footprint you, you might think of. There are calculators you can use to, to evaluate how, what is your environment impact when you do this and what is the impact to the atmosphere or, or water quality. You can use these calculators to see that. Then we, we, we provide rest networks to link with local associations and other, other interested stakeholders, which, can, which are in Finland, for example, we have been out taking outdoor activities with associations or so local farmers jointly through these associations. We work with the Rotary Club and, and Lions Club and other associations we can involve with these activities. And they are very helpful in that and, and interested to, to support the work of schools. Wiki, Wiki I already mentioned. And then we have some analytical tools like a tool to analyze the well water quality and it tells what you should do in order to improve the quality of that well, for example. And then we have split, split we have also marine Finland service that is also met for schools and, and, and public authorities and public people and, and it, it promotes the cooperation between the Baltic countries and it's in the various languages so everybody around this Baltic Sea can access to that service. Then in the projects we develop different kind of services. This is a because we noted that in transboundary water courses there is no service available for for schools because we didn't have data from Russia and Russia didn't have basically data from us so we created the service that that transboundary schools can actually do the monitoring and have access to this kind of wiki service in using their own language so now this is also possible possible in our, our transboundary water courses We have also these crowd services, some of these, for example, there is a backpack. Uh, this contains, if, contains material when you go to the field, it, it contains the tools, 
and instructions to carry out certain assignments in the in the field. Then there are professional tools like this one is the high quality water quality measurement system. So Suke provides training for these systems. We have a certification system. And, and it guarantees that this data could be fit, fed into the national environment system and, and be there forever, basically. This is a training course we held in Helsinki with the teachers and we did some measurements and they use these tablets. But it's not always, of course, when you're outdoor, it's not about electronics or something like that. Some nature centers highly appreciate that you don't take any electronic devices to the outdoor. So it really depends on the on the purpose of, of the outdoor activity you take. So what materially provide for schools? Uh, simply we have created in various projects material that actually be, uh, educators are interested in and, and want. Like latest ones are these microplastics. There are teachers material, there are exercises for students, there are videos for students and instructions. And, and you can print your own instructions or take this backpack with you with all the instructions and go to the field. So this is supports the outdoor activities also. Uh, I mentioned about this microplastic, so this Roscantuminaceous littering, a micromove it means the microplastics. As a, as teacher said that that might be interesting in in the schools to be trained for the for the students. We develop with our researchers material that that can be used to estimate the litter and microplastic in the way that is it can be related into our results so that we can really see what is the uncertainty of the observations if, if they do some. It also tells that how the litter ends to the to the waters and where it comes from and how much there is in the certain areas. You can see that from our systems. And then there are activities that we supervise how you can what are the best ways to reduce the littering in the nature that we are aware of currently. And then it encourages you to go to the nature and do it. Commonly, this, this is a teacher's guide, so about 100 pages. And you can see there is a video. Uh, how do you inv in investigate litter and microplastics? And then there's a one teacher that was involved with us and did this video with us and showed how to do it. You take the samples, you filter the plastic out, you color the plastic, and then you in the look at it with this kind of loop, or then you take that sample if you are in the higher class, like you are 15 or so student, then you go into the classroom and look at those samples from the microscope, and then we tell that how you can calculate the amount of microplastic in that sample. And then you can compare your results to the results in our systems. So that's also interesting. But it's not always so easy to compare these results because people really can do these assignments, but then to acquire the data is always, it's still currently a little bit too difficult. So we try to make it a little bit easier. Then there is a game, for example, which gives you opportunities to check how much you know, and there are some activities too. OK, so one of the things that when the Finnish national curriculum was renewed a couple of years ago was that how how the teachers can work across different topics, like how the Finnish language teacher can work with the math teacher and phys teacher, physical teacher, because there was no not much cooperation between these, these different subjects in outdoor activities or, or anywhere. They are just keeping these lectures themselves. But, so we had to create something that helps them to create classes, joint classes out, uh, outdoor. And before doing this, we of course went outdoor with the high school teachers and math, math and biology teachers and organized a course with them, with local people and so what, what is needed. And then actually two students, master students were hired 
hired to do a thesis. And one on top of these two was also looking at the, what is happening in the lectures and reporting that how it influences on students' motivation, internal and external motivation in means of pedagogics. So we are not pedagogical experts, so we had to have this expert and a professor supervising this. this. So we end up with this, this uh, way to combine this curriculum with the research process. And we had two, two topics there. We had the water research because we are water experts, but, or, but also we applied this to the energy. So in the energy sector to save energy. So those are the two topics we, we covered. And we looked at actually classes from the first grader, which is about seven years, six years old, up to the high school. So we cover all classes and you can see in the small text, life of in water environment. That is something that the small children, seven to eight years old, are working on. And then when they get to the class three to six, so they are about age of, let's say, 10 to 13, they, they are telling about stories of water. And we were thinking that how all this can be related to what we're doing, because we are doing, for example, measuring the water transparency. So we thought, OK, maybe they could build, uh, listen, the, listen the voice of, of, of some of water, what they hear there, or they could build up uh, transparency meters in the, in the lower grades and the higher grade, they could use them to measure that something. And we did a couple of examples of our building weather stations that were connected to the internet and acquired data and then analyzed those data in these classes. And also look at that how that will influence the motivation of these people during different phases in the classroom. But anyway, so we combined these two into each other. How we did it, actually, we took the curriculum and we took our water experts. We, we, most of us are doctors in this institute. We look at the, what is actually done in this kind of uh, research project and in which a phase it could be taken into, into the education. We look at the objectives of the schools, themes connecting school subjects. And then, of course, the educators were interviewed and noticed opportunities and challenges. We all know that, OK, it's quite difficult to find the time. Like now we have this COVID situation. How do you handle this? Everybody's busy. And, and then we created a core path and examples how to do it. And then when we had created this, then we tested with the uh, with, uh, 10 municipalities and, and uh, 100 teachers that is it really working? Is it useful to plan outdoor activities? So what is happening then? We, we, we design this kind of path for every grade. You have this kind of templates. And the idea was that that with this template, you, you can simply sit down with your math teacher, you can sit down with the physics teacher, and they can design a, a course using this template. Of course, in this template, there are ideas already which you can use, but you can use an open template. And you can see the topics there. In the seventh, ninth grade in Finland, the objective of curriculum is analyze inference and documentation. And the interesting topics related to water research is uh, eutrophication. And they, using this template, they plan a course and draft it that can be, they can jointly develop. And it takes maybe an hour or so. And that can be a basis for a common course for these, for these teachers. And one of these was when we built this automatic station was that it was built in the handicraft. Was it handicraft? And, and then it was taken to the physics class and math staff to analyze the data itself. So we can really couple these, these things we do and support the, also the research. So when you have planned a course, then, then of course you can take, take different kind of tools with you, with you. And we have developed this kind of backpacks, for example, with instructions, videos, 
and training materials that you can take with you. And and this in it, this is something that when you go nearby water, you take this these uh, instructions how to first there is are uh, instructions about the safety, which is one page. It's uh, of course waterproof. You read the instructions about the safety before you go to the field. It tells you what you have to be taking with you. Take the life jackets with you. Take this with you. So it's very simple instruction. And then there's an instruction to to do, for example, discharge measurements. So you can give a student instructions and they do the discharge measurement and they can do the analysis too, depending on how great they are. Or then one, some students can measure the water quality, like water transparency, and there are instructions to do that. And of course, there is instructions and, and you can use, use to measure. You can use simple devices or you can use these electronic devices, depending on the grade you are in. Of course, we have also for the species card that what are the common species in rivers or lakes or in the Baltic Sea because they vary. So we have selected these species and produced cards with with uh, experts and with with the people who are graphic designers and then discuss with the teacher that how it should look like, how, how they can recognize this, and then we provide this, these instructions in the back and then the loop to recognize these species. And this is on the left corner, you see this uh, rabbit and this, this is one of the game that was developed based on these instructions and, and exercises that can be carried out in the outdoor too, using the devices you see in this image. In the middle, you see energy and kulutuksen mitta. I mean, that, that's an energy related task. And we have also energy backpack, like I mentioned. That's the second task, what we did. OK, so this is in action. This is a Virojoki, which is the border of Finland and Russia, about 200 kilometers from where I am living. And we took these, uh, you can see these instructions for the students. And then you can see the students looking at these pieces. And you have loops that you can attach to the camera or just take take pictures of these species and check with what are they. And you can see about the size of this child uh, doing this exercise. And I think uh, uh, this is an other sample of a little, a little bit, uh, not the high uh, grade, about six to se seven to nine. So they're about 15, 14 years old. So they use these boots in the rivers because they were so interested about that. And and make, make take samples of the species and collect them from the river. And they were also motivated. In Finland, it's possible to barbecue outdoors still, like make an open fire and have a nice good sausage or whatever you eat. Unfortunately, in Russia schools, this was not anymore possible. So it's it's a really challenge. But that's basically what we've been doing. Uh, and these are the links that are provided for you. You can see more information from those websites and find the material. Some material, mostly material is finished, but there is something in English and then some instructions in Russian language. Too. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yari, for sharing your expertise with us, especially about the link between curriculum and outdoor uh, learning. Very, very interesting. We will be also uploading these uh, slides. Uh, pretty soon in the course, so you can also have a look at them again. And if you have any questions for Yari, please post them in the chat and we will address them at the end of this session. And now I would like to pass the floor to Gloria Falomirorti. Uh, Gloria, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you uh, for, for this webinar. I think it's a very interesting webinar. And well, I I hope you you enjoy my presentation. 
Well, first of all, I want to talk a bit about Interpreta Natura. We are a non-profit association that gives meanings to natural and cultural heritage for them to be loved and preserved. The, number, the members of Interpreta Natura's team have carried out territorial developing projects about natural areas protection, educational and interpretative actions for school, environmental campaigns, etc. We form a multidisciplinary team, which includes many fields like interpretation, arts, pedagogy, rural development, or natural and cultural heritage conservation. Our efforts are focused on developing actions that make people value inherited treasures in order to ensure them to take part in his conservation. Uh, this is our key to success and example of our commitment. We are specialists in, in interpretative techniques through which we emotionally link the population with the element to preserve. That is our, our slogan, know to love, love to keep. Um, be, and now, uh, in order for the participant to connect with nature and with the activity, we follow the flow learning pedagogy that is proposed by Joseph Cornell. It's a very interesting pedagogy and, I, and it is very worthy to link children and um, also with adults, with the activity and with the nature. The proposed is for stages. The first one is to raise enthusiasm. Uh, we stimulate physically and intellectually through dynamic and fun games, encouraging fun and expectation, uh, the desire for more. As you can see in the photos, uh, we like to use the theater to capture the attention for children to get involved in the activity. And it's very worthy also for children, but also for adults uh, who, who are in the activity. The second one is to focus attention. So we favor being here and now, full awareness uh, and certain attention, promoting receptively to nature and preparing us for activities of a more sensitive nature. The third one is to offer a direct experience through the experiential, direct and intuitive experience and sensory perception and awareness, we will favor deep immersion in nature. It can be by building nest boxes, by planting a pollination meadow, etc. And the, and the fourth and the last one is to share the inspiration. We will transform the experience, live learnings and sensa sensation lived into deep and lasting memories. It could be a small workshop like a bag of fragrant flowers and organic vegetables that they can bring with them to home and that link to the activity and, and all the knowledge they have uh, had in, in this experience. And now, uh, also Interpreta Natura develops many learning activities and reconnectation with nature. I would like to talk and present one of the great projects that we are currently developing. This is the ERA. It's the Active Rural Schools that is in initiatives that, that combines the school curriculum with heritage content through the experiential education with the aim of linking students with the territory and the community. And how do we do it? Interpreta Natura collaborates as an external entity to the school in the organization of workshops and weekly activities. To this end, it seeks to get the neighbors themselves to come in the school to show the same, the, themselves as experts in heritage, uh, creating also rural references for the children. In this way, a network of local associations, families and neighbors committed to the education of the youngest children has been created and they regularly come to, the, to carry out activities in the school or participate in the garden days. Well, in the project, we work around four fundamental pillars that are the first one is the natural heritage of the Sierra Espadán because our village is inside of a natural park. And for this purpose, we have worked with also with the technicians of the natural park. As you can see in the images, uh, we carry out activities to identify native spaces, to identify the water cycle as it passes through the village. We carry out the reforestation and ecosystem conservation tasks, etc. The second one is the cultural heritage. Uh, 
Uh, we talk about local festivities, traditional work, and agricultural knowledge that show the sustainable relationship between the population and the territory. That is a is is a, a very relationship in in the rural areas. So here you have various examples in which various neighbors have come to teach us traditional tools, tell us about the musical heritage of the town, or invite us to make oil from olives. We always seek to get the population involved in those activities, since this also fosters intergenerational links and the creation of rural references. Here we are uh, making canned tomato with with the grandparents uh, from the orchard. All the tomato we we grow in the orchard, we did uh, canned. Uh, the third pillar is the material where we have more images about the oil process with children and also with the farmers. The third uh, pillar is the material heritage. Uh, here in the village there is an important uh, Moorish uh, castle and also we have a, a lot of stone corals in the, in the mountains and the chinks of the civil war. And also when we work with children, we try to value the heritage through the play. So we carry out various gymkanas on the civil wars and also about the castle. And in those photos, uh, we did an activity where boys and girls had to collect truthful information about the castle to find a hidden treasure that was like the, the final gift of the activity, that it was material to do a workshop so they can bring the theater, uh, the, a, little the a little castle to their homes. And the last pillar of the project is the, the orchard, the orchard, educational and intergenerational garden as a space for collective creation and meeting. So here we do uh, activities every week with children in the schools, but also we, we do activities for all the community. Uh, in fact, we have created a book in which the curricula, curricula contents of the school can be applied in the garden. So in this way, the garden because, uh, becomes an open air classroom where math, natural science, Spanish languages and history can be learned. For example, instead of studying graphs in class, we go to the garden and graph the growth of vegetables. Instead of studying the plants, we create a planting farm work and calculate how many cabbages, for example, we can fit on a ridge if they have to be planted every 50 centimeters. So in the orchard, we can practice a lot of contents of the curriculum, uh, of the scholar curriculum. In addition, during uh, vacation periods, community days are held to continue with the maintenance of the orchard. So we have here, well, the, those are uh, some activities we do with children and also during the summer or maybe in the, um, in the weekends, we do days uh, for community and families and uh, well, the orchard has become a very welcoming space in which families, teaching staff and older adults and volunteers share with recipes, share time and, and enjoy the, the outdoor. The, that, that project has proven to be an effective initiative for linking uh, children with the territory, but also to fix population in the territory, because well, Vidal Monacid is a village with with problems of the population, uh, as well as a lot of municip uh, a lot of towns uh, around us. So we are we are uh, working uh, for for uh, do that project in all the schools of of the natural park. Um, uh, more and more families opt for an education in the open air and root in the territory, which connects with the rhythms of the land and has time to contemplate nature. And that is a, 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 need, a, a need now uh, because of, of the COVID also. So there's a lot of families who came to, 
to uh, to the village to live and 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 to go out of of cities. And now I want to talk because this year we are uh, now working on another project that is uh, that complements the active school. So we want to present the, that project. Its name is Review El Territory, uh, in which several actions in favor of the endemic fauna will be developing in schools. The children will become aware of their co-responsibility in the reintroduction of endangered species in the environment as a metaphor of the need of conserve the inhabitants of rural areas. It's an initiative that will promote the biodiversity of the municipality while involving citizens' participation in a way that increases the co-responsibility in conservation. With experiences of reconnectation with nature and in favor of wildlife, such as the placement of nest boxes, the creation of pollination meadows, the construction of insect hotels, and the breeding and subsequent release of jobs in the natural environment. That experiences uh, reconnect us with the nature and make us aware of our role in conservation in an experiential way, establishing an emotional bond that mobilizes us. That is our slogan, no to love, love to preserve. It is a need to link children with nature for them to know about the, um, the, the need of conserving it. If not, there is also a thing that is far away from them. And, they have to touch it, to smell it, and to stay there. Uh, here you have some photos. Uh, those are uh, of the triops, that is a uh, uh, dangerous spaces here. And uh, that are photos of the breeding and release process. And it was very interesting since the boys and girls studied their biology, their needs, and take care of them for two months, more or less. From this moment, we look for a raft that would suit them because uh, they have a specific characteristics. And it was very enriching because the day of the release, the children had mixed feelings that the attachment and esteem of so many weeks of care and the knowledge that the greatest act of love towards them was to release their in the natural environment. So here we have photos of the releasing day. All them have names and well, um, mm, there are some days that we go to to that site to, to see if we can see them. Another experience that we want to repeat this year due to its re great reception among the educational team and the natural park is the breeding and release of gallipatos, that is another endangered space, is this one. Um, in addition, the boys and girls know that they can go to, to that raft whenever they want to visit their friends. And in the school also we have uh, photos with the characteristics and the biology of those animals. So that's all. I have tried to be brief. I hope you found it interesting and uh, thank you very much for the attention. Uh, thank you very much to the organiz uh, to organizers and it has been a pleasure. I remain attentive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gloria, for such an interesting and engaging presentation. So now we move on to this uh, Q&A session. Um, so uh, you can ask questions by writing in, in the chat and we will try to address them as soon as possible. Uh, so while teachers are typing the questions uh, in the chat, we can perhaps start by addressing some of the questions that we already received in advance that we posted in the course. For example, uh, let's start with the first one for, I guess, for Yari and for Gloria. What are the benefits of outdoor education in your opinion? I don't know if uh, any of you would like to answer this question. Yeah, see, it, my, yes, my Jare here. I think I think we all have seen probably this Palmer tree where you build, build the enthusiastic empathy towards the environment, and that's I I think where the role of these outdoor activities is. That it's 
it's already good if you get people into the nature, but it's even better if they do something to improve the nature. Whether it's a monitoring, it's something they do something. The best, of course, would be that they do take some activities to improve the quality of this environment. They restore the, something, they remove even a small piece of plastic, then they build good relation with the nature. That's very important indeed, the relationship with nature. I think also, Gloria, you were talking about that in your presentation. Would you like to add something to this? Yes, uh, for me, uh, education in nature has a lot of benefits. Connect with the natural rhythms, gets to know the seasonal vegetables, also about uh, health, uh, also about the fauna and the flora natives. It is important that natural, uh, nature be something lived that is not on, only in the television or only in the holidays. Um, it is important that they can touch, smell, and stay in the nature for them to to have to encourage to conserve it. Because if not, they can recycle, they can do a lot of things, but they are not uh, uh, they are not conscious about it. So it's very important. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, the next question, I'm guessing it will be more for Yari. Um, we live in a cold climate. How can I involve our school, our school, my students in outdoor activity in such a cold climate? Yes, thank you. That, that was a good question. Uh, when we thought about outdoor activities, we thought that we have this uh, 12 months. And of course, I know that the education you have less months than than in a typical year but we thought that in the in various times of the of the year you can do various activities and and we have we have a cal year yearly calendar and during the winter we have instructions to make for example snow water equivalent or or frost depth so there are activities you can do during the winter or snow and and when you measure the water equivalent i mean that the weight of the water of the snow so because it piles up in the roofs and when there is too much water, uh, snow on the roof you have to remove it basically or sometimes you're interested about the frost depth are your pipes freezing or something like that those are the activities we promote to do or just go for skiing and measure the ice thickness in the in the lakes in finland of course we have these lakes where you can go and not in all countries but Thank you so much, Yari. Uh, we have we go back to the chat because uh, we are getting some questions and nice comments. Uh, this one I think is for Gloria. I really like the idea that uh, it is intergenerational and incorporates the entire community. I think that's related to the last project that you were mentioning. Um, are there workshops just one day or do the children return over a period of time? Super for the children to see the importance of what they are studying in the class being used in real life uh, scenarios. OK, uh, here in this school we do one session every week with children in the orchard and also one session every week uh, linked to to heritage, cultural material. Every week is different. And also, uh, well, to the orchard we go always the same day, so the families know it and some families came, and also the neighbors know it and, and sometimes the, the grandparents or, or neighbors come to the, to the orchard. Uh, I want to say that we are an external organization to the school, so, so we make the work much easier for, for the teachers because we understand that they often do not have the knowledge or the time to carry out those activities. Uh, so that is why I encourage all of you to get in touch with those organizations that, that sometimes are nearly you, that are dedicated to this in your territories and look for uh, new forms to collaborate on with them. You can also talk, talk to the families or the neighbors because they have uh, too much con to contribute uh, in those questions. 
So you always can can have help with uh, from people around you, uh, and that's all. Super. Thank you so much. I think participants are taking note and for sure, I think uh, once they start researching, they can look for many organizations and many uh, people that are already doing great things around the school. Uh, I go back to the course itself. We had a very interesting question. I think any of uh, you can answer. What is your opinion on the use of mobile phones, cameras and even the Internet uh, during outdoor activities? How do you see this? Yeah, if I if I may may say something, it's I have noticed that there are different opinions about this. I I've been discussing with the nature centers, and I personally feel that see that when I was with the nature center, and they and lady said there that no 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 electronic the electronic device is outdoor, and if I look at this nature center, they keep courses for the school, so the schools can send their students to that nature center and they go outdoor with them. I, I, I think that's a very relevant question that should, how much should there be and at what age? Because I think it is coming, becoming a challenge. I know the, the negative side of electronics in the schools or social media, we everybody know where it leads to. There is a research on that using too much internet or too much social media is not good for your your mental health, health. So you have to be, you have to think about it. I think I, I can say I have no solution to to say that. For me, I think it's not the moment to to stay with technologies. But now uh, there are a lot of apps that contribute to knowledge. So I always consider that you can wait until you get home to look for this information. You can take photos or something like that. Pero, but I, I, uh, the intention is that they are present in the moment, in the activity, in the nature. And if the technology do not interfere with this, they are not a problem. Then it, do, then it would be to have a controlled and conscious use. Thank you so much. It is indeed about what uh, Yari was talking about, age related, and also what Gloria just said, balance and see what the uh, outcome of the activity is going to be. If you really need it to use it, if it's going to have added value to your lesson or not, or if you could do it before or after. Um, another question that we had in the course was, which types of outdoor activities could I organize with students with safety? Which safety, which security precautions would you suggest when uh, starting an outdoor activity for the first time? Yeah, Might be a tricky one to answer. <laughs> yeah, this is a, <laughs> quite tricky. OK, so originally we, did, we didn't have any instructions about safety when the people go nearby waters. And, and we were thinking, OK, there are some associations that have some ideas, but they were not, were not really like the kind we wanted with the schools when we discussed with teachers. So we developed guide, the, the, uh, guide, <laughs> some kind of instruction, which is to a five size double side short selling, telling that what you should be. be careful when you go and and it also had to cover the winter that winter you have to be watch out this one when you measure the discharge you have to be careful that it's not flowing too fast so what is too fast flowing waters and <laughs> what is not and what you should take with you and and so that you should go with two people instead of one and you should have some rope piece of rope or something and where there is more information. So we have a small in this backpack. We have a small instruction that helps teachers to track the most important points and what what you should consider. But uh, I, I think it's in Finland, uh, it's, it's the school's responsibility. So they said that we can manage this, but we provide this short guide that helps a little bit about, of course, the students that they can read it in the, in the field. 
keeping in mind that we have five minutes left, uh, Gloria, maybe in another kind of climate, uh, any precautions that uh, we should have when taking the children outside? For me, uh, nature is a safe space. For me, it's not dangerous. Uh, you have to know all the spaces, the vegetable spaces, uh, for them not to to eat something there is uh, there is not good for them. But uh, the city for me is more dangerous, and the people don't worry about it. Uh, moving in nature is is something that you can train, and it is very noticeable when children spend time in or when children don't spend time in nature because they don't know uh, how to walk. But I think we have to rely on the natural abilities and it is a part of the process of self-knowledge and self-control of the children. And sometimes the, those fears are more about us than about them because they know how to move and, and to, to stay in nature. Great suggestion. Thank you so much, Gloria, as well, Yari. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Uh, so with a little bit of time left, I would like to squeeze in one more question related to what you just said, Gloria, about the city, because we had also participants asking in the course, how can an outdoor, outdoor activity be organized in the city center, for example? Many schools, they might not have access to a large outdoor area. Uh, what are your suggestions on this? Sorry. For me, uh, it's important also to say to children that in the city there is also nature. You don't have to go very far from there to see uh, birds, to see plants. You can uh, also in the in the background of the school, you can see a lot of types of birds and you can identify them. And also in the parks, there are trees, there, there, there are animals interacting. You only have to open your eyes and 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 see that that in the cities also there is nature and it's a very poderous uh, thought because we also form part of those environment. No? Thank you, Yari. Any last thoughts on this? Um, perhaps you have more access to uh, nature areas, but. If you had to give any advice advice on uh, activities in the city center, what would you suggest? <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. I, <laughs> in the city areas, it, I know it's kind of difficult, but I have noticed that it it's really difficult to motivate certain certain teenagers. But I think there are always means to do that. You just have to think about it a little bit. Yes, indeed. Uh, it's also uh, up to us, the teachers, to really do our research and uh, motivate our students, like you're saying, and also uh, taking Gloria's comment that indeed uh, there might be something. We are also part of nature, uh, even in a schoolyard or around ourselves, any park, any space that we can uh, use. Uh, we can really take the children outside and enjoy a different kind of learning. And with uh, being conscious of the time, I would like to thank you everyone who joined today's webinar, but also I would like to say a big thanks to our speakers, Yari Zilander and Gloria falomir for joining us today, taking your time and share your expertise. It was really a pleasure. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> see you. <laughs> thank you so much. And we hope to see you all on our next live event the Teach Meet, which will take place uh, next week on the 27th of January, also on Thursday, but this time at 6 p.m. Central European time. And if you would like to be a speaker and take part also of these kind of live events and share your expertise, your learning scenarios, please keep an eye on the course, on the live uh, event um, section uh, where you can see how to apply. And thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed this very interesting webinar on outdoor learning and we we'll see you on the next one. Thank you and bye bye. Life Terra is co-financed by the European Commission through the Life Programme.